1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Pray that the Lord meet with us and that His will be done. He might speak to our hearts. He might speak to every one of us. He might make sure that we're in the place where the God Almighty would have us to be. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read two verses and then I'm going to jump up and read a few more. All right? Verse 23 and 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That means entire, complete. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Let us pray. Father, we love and appreciate your goodness and mercy and your wonderful grace that you've loved us with. We can't give you praise enough to thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing and Lord, what you're going to do. Still yet, our Father, Lord, for us that are, are saved and are for those that are lost and need to be saved. And I pray, Father, you work. Lord, while there's time and not knowing when that midnight call is going to come or when we're going to leave this life. Our Father, we're going to go by the way of the grave or by the way of judgment. Lord, and I pray that everybody under the sound of my voice today, Father, is able to know for sure that they're saved, that they're ready, Lord God, for that time that's coming. For your word to speak to our hearts, we give you praise and honor and glory. Take the service, use it for your kingdom's sake. May it increase in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. May God sanctify you through and through. That's the idea behind verse 20. Through our, the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly, through and through, entire, everything, every part of you, every little aspect of who you are. Amen. Your hair, your, your fingernails, your toenails. Amen. Every part of you be sanctified, holy, entirely. Every part of you. Had a man come up to me this last week at work, and he said, you remember me. And I hadn't seen him in a while. The truck driver said, yes, I do. And we had had some good conversation before and about the Word of God. And uh, he was made mention of something, and I said, uh, yeah. And then he said something else, and I said, but wait just a minute. And uh, he had the idea that uh, whenever that uh, we're in this life, uh, what, uh, and I've mentioned this before in, in uh, sermons, uh, that people believe today, and he's one of them evidently believes, uh, that what you do in your body doesn't affect your soul or your spirit much. And so uh, I, I kind of, he quoted a verse, and he quoted it wrong, and I love it when they quote a verse, and I love it more when they quote it wrong, uh, because that, that shows me that there's a bias. When you when something you try to make fit what you believe, there's a bias behind it, and they'll quote it that way. And so I want to encourage you that anytime someone tries to prove a point by quoting a verse of scripture, make sure they quoted it correctly. Amen. Amen. And so he quoted it, and I said, that's not what it says. Oh, yes, what it said, he quoted it again that way. And so I don't know what version of, of scripture that he's using, but he did say that's KJV. And I said, no, I don't think it is. So I whipped out my Bible on my phone and got him right there to it and showed him. And then he kind of stopped for a minute and mm, okay. Uh, but he still went on believing that what you do in your body doesn't affect your spirit. Maybe a little bit. I got him kind of convinced the idea that it affects you a little bit. But here he's talking about what Paul telling the Thessalonians. And this is a prayer that he's praying, right? This is something that's not entirely done yet. And I told you before that God is working in our hearts and lives, and he won't be done with us until they pat our face with a shovel. Amen? And when we're done in this life is when God's going to be done working on us. We're under construction, whether it be our face, our nose, our ear, or our eyes, or whatever it is, uh, on the outside is also what God wants to do on the inside. And that's what I believe today. Uh, the first thing we need to get fixed up in our heart and in our lives is what's on the inside. Because that's what's eternal. 
And that's what means more, amen, of something in this life and this body. This body is getting old. It changes. It has all kind of things going on with it. Uh, but that which is on the inside is what's eternal. This outside not eternal. It's not glorified yet. We are in a mortal body. Or we are in a corruptible body. Uh, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the corruptible putting on incorruption. Amen. And this mortal putting on immortality. We're not there yet. We still have got a ways to go. Amen. I said so God's still working on us. He's still trying to change our hearts and our lives. And I think about the idea that we've got that he's praying about this, about something that needs yet to be done. And I think about us today, about not being perfect, but that being our desire. Uh, Paul said he's not yet perfect, but he's reaching forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So he's reaching towards something. Paul believed uh, that there was work that needed to be done in him. I believe there's work that needs to be done in me. Amen. Do you believe there's work that needs to be done in you? Amen. Amen. I think about our lives and where we are as Christians. I'm talking especially to Christians today. Uh, my advice for those that are not Christian is to get Christian. Amen. Get right with God. Get saved. Amen. Get under the blood. And then let God begin His work of sanctification in you. What He said in verse 23. I pray God your whole spirit your soul and body, what? Sanctified, be sanctified. The word sanctified means to be set apart. The Bible tells us when we're saved, we're set apart. The word holiness means to be separated from that which is evil. And so the whole idea of Christianity is to be taken up out of our sin and to be placed in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is holy. And no man, the Bible said, Paul said, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Amen. And so we've got to have holiness. People today that's in the Baptist church kind of shy away a little bit from holiness. My friend, you need not shy away from it. Jesus Christ is able to make you holy and to keep you holy. Amen. Uh, but the whole point of this, go back up a couple of verses of Scripture, verse 14, and he's going he, uh, through this, and here's the, the whole thing that fits together. Now we exhort you, which means he earnestly teaches you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. And so he's saying, brethren, warn them who are unruly brethren. Take that and get it together. You can't warn those that are not saved, right? Uh, you can warn them, but they're not unruly. They're just doing what comes natural to them. And so he's talking to the church of Thessalonica, and he's talking to Bethel Grace Church. I want to say BG, Bethel Grace, amen. He's talking to you and me today. He said, exhort them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded. That is, again, me and you. Amen. Come on. Say with me. I support the weak. Be patient toward all men. This is good teaching that Paul's given them. And it's evidently something he knew by the Spirit of God that they needed. I want to say this morning that it hasn't gone out of style. It's still something me and you need. Amen. And she said, see that none render evil for evil. Someone does you wrong. Don't necessarily mean you got to do them wrong. Amen. Don't have to turn that turn back. We need to turn the cheek. We need to bear one another's burdens. We need to be merciful, graceful. He said, and, and, and uh, on the amen, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men, to the church, those that are unruly, and then all people. Let me read it again. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, amen, but ever follow that which is good, the church, amen, you need to follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Then he said, rejoice evermore. <laughs> amen. Now, Don, we were saying a little while ago, I've had that summer cold or allergy that some of y'all heard coughing, like me, have been going through for a week or so. And so it's hard to rejoice evermore uh, in singing when you want to sing, not really there. And on that last song, I purpose because you were struggling, I'm going to sing with you. Amen. And so I say, hey, well, what a friend we have in Jesus. And I'm going to be a friend unto Jesus. Then he said, rejoice evermore. He's telling us to rejoice evermore. Let me encourage you 
this morning to take God at His word because He's commanding you to rejoice evermore. You like that? I don't care whether you do or not. <laughs> he said, pray without ceasing. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to pray without ceasing. That means that a lot of times when you say amen, you've not amen. That you may have some more to go with it. Uh, when I'm praying, a lot of times I just finish and don't ever say amen. I just let it go and I keep uh, thinking about whatever else might come after that. Amen. It's an open-ended prayer which has no end. And so I'm praying and I'm thinking about this. I'm praying about the church folks. I'm praying about your special needs, things you're going through, things that are in your future, one thing and another. And then I get to that place where I'm not sure what else to say and I just stop. I'm not done praying, but I'm waiting on Him, and we're kind of communing together, and I've not said amen. There are times when I am done, and I say amen, and then He'll say, hey, I'm not done. You done, I'm not done. I got something else I need to tell you, amen. But there are times when I say amen, and He says, amen. All right, we're done. Conversation is, it's kind of like we, uh, we're on the phone, and we say, bye, bye. Amen, amen. I'm done, I'm done, you're done. That's it. What are you talking about? Rejoice evermore. We're not to ever get done. Come on, church. Never done rejoicing what we have of our hope and the joy and the peace that God has done to us, worked in our heart and life. We see this world where people are shooting one another, where ground is falling on folks, and there's volcanoes, and there are earthquakes, and there's tsunamis, and all this heartache, and all this trouble, and everything involved with it. I'm listening for the midnight call. Yes. Amen. Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks while you're praying uh, for this is the will of God. We're to be a thankful people. The most thankful people on the face of the earth ought to be those that saved and have the blood applied and know that their name's written in heaven and that if you should die and you close your eyes, you'll open them up in the first place. The first face that you'll see is the face of Jesus Christ, amen. And I think, friend, about what we've got in Jesus Christ is more than what we give up in this world. Paul said all these things uh, that were for him, he counted as gain, amen, that are as, as, as dumb that he would just toss them away. They didn't mean anything to him. He said, what I have in Jesus Christ, that's what meant the world to Paul. If, if you're saved today, you ought to rejoice evermore because what you have in Jesus means more than this entire world has to offer today. Amen. What we have in Jesus Christ is the greatest thing possible that you can imagine. Yes. Uh, this body and perfect health is not going to last. Our gold and our silver and our homes and our cars and our automobiles, all these things that we have, our possession, and we got them. We locked the car, we locked the house, we kind of keep an eye when we're out walking around. All these things we try to keep. One day we're going to give them up regardless. Amen. And, but the most important thing is what you got in your soul. Amen. With the possession of Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life. Amen. The thing that he's blessed us with there. And he said, then the next per verse, verse 19, quench not the spirit. I believe today, friend, uh, that's what the, uh, our church world is so guilty of doing. Uh, quenching the spirit, God moves upon you. We get about the singing, the congregational singing. And I'll tell you, friend, Bethel Grace hurts when it comes to singing. I don't believe everybody's singing with their whole heart and with their whole spirit, not singing like you ought to. I'll just give you a little primer on singing and praising the Lord. If there's nothing wrong with your body, you ought to lift your voice and you ought to praise God. You're not, not, not here to put on a competition and maybe sing louder than the person next to you, or as it is in a lot of churches, softer than the person next to you. You ought to lift up your voice. You're in the presence of Almighty God, and you ought to sing like it. Amen. 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 
lift him up, give him praise, honor, and glory. When, when this world is the quietest place you'll ever be. Amen. You think about, oh, I'm all nice, quiet, and conservative, and reserved, and everything's fine. And, oh, I'll tell you, friend, you get to hell, and there's going to be people shouting and hollering and screaming, and they won't matter who's next to them down there. It's not going to be a comfort, amen, to them. If you get to heaven and you're around the throne and you don't like noise, you might try to find a quiet corner and glory with hand, amen, because when you get to heaven, it's going to be loud up there. There's praise around the throne. If you get away from it, there's going to be a quartet singing down the road. There's going to be some other folks down the other place. going to be quiet singing and praising God. There's no place in heaven that's going to be quiet. Amen. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real soft preacher now. I'm not the, I'm, I'm a real quiet preacher. I'm not loud like I used to be. I'm not boisterous like I used to be. I used to run and jump the pews and hang off the chandeliers and all those other things. And uh, people would come up to me and say, well, you're going to die of a heart attack. You keep preaching like that. And I'd be red in the face and about to die. And now I'm 67, almost 68 years of age. And I can barely get around. And I'm still trying to holler out the glory of God. This is no time to be quiet. You need to praise the Lord. Amen. Lift him up and give him glory and honor. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Amen. Quench not the spirit. How many people want to testify uh, during the service and you feel like, boy, I ought to say something for Jesus. I ought to say something. No, Sue will do it. Uh, Hank, Hank will do it. No, someone else will do it. I won't have to do it today. I'll do it tonight because they'll do it now. Amen. Now, my friend, I don't quench the Spirit of God. Despise not prophesying. And that doesn't mean just foretelling the future. It means despise not my preaching. Amen. Amen. That's what it's talking about too. Through all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Then verse 23 and 24. And the very God of peace shall sanctify you holy. The first word in verse 23 is and. It's a conjunction. It joins those together. It's not a single thought. It's a together thought that you have. It Verses 14 through 22 are working in your life, and there's no problem in verse 23 and 24 because in verses 14 through 22, you're yielding to the Holy Spirit of God. Then you get down uh, to the place of verse 23 and 24, and you see God can do the work in you that needs to be done because we're what? We're under construction, are we not? As Christians, we're under construction. Well, the little song that uh, the kids used to sing, some adults used to sing, I used to sing, is he's still working on me. Amen. I'm glad I'm not a finished work. I look in the mirror, spiritually speaking, from time to time, and I'm glad that God's not done working in my heart and in my life. I'm yielding to Him. And then this world comes in and it interferes with my yielding to Him. And I have to look back into the mirror, my spiritual mirror, and see where I'm at with God and see the things that yet need perfection. How many believe that there's a need of perfection in our life? How many remembers the bracelets on that they used to have? P B P G I N F W A M Y. Yeah, please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. P B P G I N F W M Y. Amen. God not finished with us yet. We're a work in progress. We need something done in our hearts and our lives. I'm not telling you today that you can't mature and get closer to God and be real good at God. That same thing I was talking to the other day. Uh, he said, do you mean to tell me you've not sinned today? And it was uh, somewhere around 1030. And I said, yeah, as far as I know, I've not sinned against the God today. As far, so far, I'm good. It's exactly what I told him. I said, I don't know the thing that I've done this wrong. I've prayed. I've looked at his word. Amen. I've been sent to the spirit. I've not looked at anything that I'm not supposed to. They got anything come out of my mouth that wasn't right for me to say. Yeah, as far as I know right now today at 1030 or 11 o'clock, I'm sinless. Amen. Trouble him a little bit, I'll tell you that. It troubled him. And how can you do that? And I said, well, what the Bible tell me to do? 
And that's what I'm doing. Amen. It's that simple. Now, if you ask me, it's 12 30, it might have been a different story. But I don't know of anything. Huh? How you like them beans? <laughs> don't know of a thing. Now, I don't know about the whole day. I may have been pretty much without the whole day without having to say, oops, I messed up there. Amen. Why well, these people who believe that you can't, yet that you sin every day? I've got news for them. If you're a Christian, you don't. That's not Amen. the purpose. Paul tells or John tells us uh, that we are not to, to, to abide in sin. We're to flee from sin, flee from the evil. These things, but people want to dwell in them. And I just don't hardly understand that at all. But my friend, God wants to give you peace. Peace comes from knowing that your life is right with God. And the thing that bothered Festus when Paul preached about righteousness and uh, a judgment to come, uh, he got under uh, Festus, Felix's skin and troubled him about his life. And Felix trembled. Well, friend, you ought to tremble if your life's not right with God. Amen. Amen. Because one day you're going to stand in front of him. Uh, those people that that beach fell on. Do you think that all them folks were ready for God? Ready for that time? But you don't need a, a beach to fall on you, a bank of, of, of dirt to fall on you. Amen. You might have that. You might go out in a car accident. You might have a heart attack. Amen. A building may fall on you. I don't know when you're going to leave. I don't know how you're going to leave. I know you're going to leave and you be, need to be ready when that time comes, no matter if you're seven or eight or nine or 10 or 11 or 12 years of age or 13 or in your 20s, your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 100, whatever your age is, you need to be ready. And the only way you get ready is get saved and stay saved. Amen. Get right and stay right. Amen. That's what he tells us in his word. When despise not prophet, prove all things, hold that which is that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Every bit of you, body, soul, and spirit. That's what he's talking about. Look with me in the book of James, chapter 1. I want to read a verse of scripture to you, a couple of them. James, uh, chapter 1. And he tells us in verse 21, Wherefore lay aside all filthiness and superfluity or, or excess uh, overboard uh, naughtiness of evil and receive with meekness the engrafted word amen the word of god so when a person gets saved uh, they're born of the word of god uh, the word of god is what forms them uh, so the word of god is uh, speaks to our heart and uh, our soul and we get conviction and uh, we get saved. That's how that, that works. The Word of God speaks it. Uh, being born again, Peter said, not a corruptible seed, but an incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. First, uh, uh, First Peter 1 and 23. So we're born again of the Holy Word of God. It is implanted or engrafted, which is able to save your soul. Then he said in verse 22, but be ye hearers of the word, or doers of the word, and not hearers only. And I think that's another thing uh, that the church has got so sideways today. Uh, yeah, I hear what it says, uh, but that's not what comes out in my life. Uh, in Sunday school class, we talked about how that people see what your life is and what's in your life and then what uh, they expect out of your life. Because when you get saved, the world looks at you and expects better. Huh? Is that right? When the world looks at you and you become part of the Christian family of God, the world looks on you and expects better. I remember, I believe it's Tom Brokaw, uh, that one time when uh, Jim Baker and uh, Swagger and all them guys uh, got caught up in their mischief, their evil, their sin, their wickedness, and they, you know, Tom Brokaw did an interview with some preacher, I can't remember the preacher's name, but this is what Tom Brokaw said. He said, we, outside the church is what he said, we expect better of you. And then the answer that the individual gave uh, said, well, but we're human too. Worst thing I'd have said, amen. I never would have said that we're human too. You know how to say it? How to say it? They made a mistake. They sinned against God. 
And that's the reality that you still have the ability to either go God's way or go against God's way. Amen. But yes, I agree that the church world should do better than what sinners are doing. So when a sinner sees a Christian, they ought to see something that they want to have in their heart life. They ought to be able to see a difference. My friend, in the world today, in many churches, you can't tell the difference between a bartender or a hooker and a church member. You can't hardly tell the difference. They're all living the same kind of a lifestyle. Stop. There ought to be a difference in your heart. If you've been born again and the Holy Spirit of God when Jesus said when he went away to, to uh, go to heaven, he would send back to us and he would teach us and guide us into all truth and righteousness. So if you've got the Holy Spirit of God inside your heart and life and he's teaching you and guiding you when you go against him, it ought to trouble you. It ought to be conviction. I do believe that the world expects more of me better of me than what the world is going by. Amen. And when the church is exactly what the world is, they see no reason to get right with God. The church is still under construction. There's still a work that needs to be done in my life. And friend, I would almost guarantee you in your life as well. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be closer to completion. <laughs> That preacher going to Midland. You should be a lot closer to completion than when you first got saved. Yes. Hey. Amen. Yeah. You ought to be able to see some window dressing now. You ought to be able to see some improvement now. Now we didn't build us from scratch. God's doing a renovation work on us. Amen. Mm -hmm. The world has had its thing and done to us. Now God's trying to work on those that are saved. Amen. Complete them wholly. Make them entirely like Him. The work that God wants to get done. Have you looked in the mirror lately according to what He said? If any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror, a shiny piece of glass. Now, often they would polish metal, silver, gold, Brass and you can get a reflection out of it. Uh, they had some mirrors back then that weren't real, real popular. A lot of work and expense went in, in making a mirror, and it wasn't perfect. It was wavy. The glass wasn't perfect back then in their day and age. And so they would look at that glass and they would move their face around a little bit to see how their image was. And in like a natural man, beholding his image in a glass, and he would see, well, it's a hair out of place. Hey man, he looked to see everything look good. Yeah, I look pretty good. According to myself, in this mirror, I look pretty good. Hey Amen. But a man that is a Christian is not just a hearer of the Word of God. He's a doer of the Word of God. And why do we as Christians want to obey God? Because we love Him. Hey Amen. We love Him. I don't have to have my wife tell me that I don't need to go out and commit adultery. I love her and I'm not going to go out and commit adultery. It's not something that she would want me to do and I love her. I'm not going to go out and commit sin because I love God. But it's not something he would want me to do so I'm not going to do it. No man purposes that saying no man purposes to do sin if you say but let's go on. He said, For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. So we look in the mirror, we look at it, and we go away, we put the mirror up, we go out, we get in, into the world, in, in the place, and then after a while, uh, the world, the wind, and the people, and the shaking, and the bumping, and everything, kind of messes that image up, and it doesn't look like it did when we first looked in that mirror. We forget what manner of man he was the way we look. Now apply that spiritually. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, which is the word of God, and continues therein, and being not a forgetful hearer, how do you 
not be a forgetful hearer of the word of God, but a doer of the word. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. So the way that you are not a forgetful hearer as a Christian is that the word of God abides in you. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit of God abides in you. We live in a time where people don't don't want nobody to tell them what to do. And I've had people tell me uh, that they don't go to church because they don't want nobody telling them how to live. Well, friend, I'll tell you how to live because that's what God's Word told me how to tell you to live. But if you don't want to live that way, it's entirely up to you. One day, we'll stand before God. Every one of us, me and you and everyone else, are going to stand before God and we're going to be asked why we didn't do what He told us to do. Not suggested. Huh? But you look at the Ten Commandments. That's uh, the 613 commandments in the Old Testament. People only remember ten. Well, they're pretty good ones, right? But the problem is people say those are ten suggestions. Not ten suggestions. I take them or leave them just as I want to. I'm not going to have no... 4,500 year old book tell me what to do. I'll mean, tell you what, you're going to be judged by that 4,500 year old book. And you better be able to say amen. Uh, amen. Amen. The work that he's got going in your heart, <coughs> in your life. Whosoever looks into perfect law of liberty continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. This man shall be blessed. In his deed, and if any monk seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man religion is vain. Pure religion is undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit fathers, the widows, and their affliction, and keep himself unspotted from this world. Amen. Well, there's a whole lot more to go, but not this morning. Under construction. I read where uh, a man, can't remember the uh, sculpture, uh, was commissioned to make something out of a huge piece of marble. And uh, he got to working in it and uh, found a flaw in, in the marble and what he was working on wouldn't work, so he abandoned the project. Uh, later on, another man took up the work and he worked a little while and that flaw was just in the way, so he gave up on it. And then Michelangelo uh, got to sculpting with it, and he worked around through that flaw and uh, sculpted the uh, statue of David uh, that everybody knows about. And he worked within those flaws that were in it and made one of the most notable sculptures uh, that people can almost identify uh, by eyesight and know that's Michelangelo's David sculpture. And so God's doing that with us, amen. He's working in our heart and in our life to make us with all of our faults and our flaws and our errors and our, our, our troubles that we've got. He's working in us to perfect around those faults and failures, amen, and make something out of us because we're under construction. It's not going to be finished till we get to glory. Yes. The only reason... The only reason it's not going to be finished until we get there is God's construction environment is too messy here. <clears throat> Ever since the fall of man and the perfection of the Garden of Eden, after the Garden of Eden, we live in a fallen world and this mess is hard to clean again. Now, he can start to work here, but when he gets us to heaven, where that everything's holy and perfect and pure, he can finish the work. Then we'll be perfectly conformed in the image of God. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be a lot further along, maybe, than what a lot of folks are. I'm not being your judge. I'm just looking at me. I've mentioned this before. Some people grow faster, some slower. But the Bible says some 30, 60, some 100, that there ought to be something in us that is moving forward and closer to God. I'll tell you, friend, if you've got the sweet Holy Ghost in your heart and in your life, He's moving you toward God Amen. and moving you away from the world. 
Now, if that's not happening, it's only one reason for it. You're not where God would have you to be. And the Holy Spirit is not able to work in your life. Would you say?